touch of the Spirit. Divine touch of the Lord. His name's above all names. And He's worthy of all praise. And my heart will see how great. surgery all in a month period and uh, my wife and I've been going up to see her and praying with her was up there today and uh, they're looking to God and uh, I want us to pray for her right now would you her name is Sonia Ewing just ask God to move in that hospital room give her a complete restoration would you lift your voice and your hands and ask God if he would move these are people that know about the Lord but have not been serving. But now they're talking about feeling their need of serving God. Come on, let's reach out to the Lord. Ask Him to do a miracle that they can come back to the house of the Lord and serve the Lord. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. There is a, I will not say names, I will protect that. But there is a, there is a family in our church who just last week prayed, God, whatever you've got to do to my lost child, that's a product, will turn them back to you. Whatever you gotta do, time's running out, and I need you to do it. And since that prayer, God has done a drastic, made a drastic situation, and that prodigal child has uh, had a pretty significant twist of attitude in the right direction. And I want us, I, I want us to pray, God. 
You're very good at finishing what you start. Matter of fact, it's very possible that child could even come for Easter services. God, you're good at finishing what you started. We want you to touch every prodigal. Between now and Sunday, God, do a work in that prodigal. They could not escape. But not just them, there's a lot of other prodigals. And God, if you'll do it for that one, there's others that we need you to do it for. Would you pray that right now? Come on, the Spirit of the Lord is here. The Spirit of the Lord is doing a work here. Let's believe right now. Let's believe right now. Ask and believe. Ask and believe. In the name of the Lord Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Do the work that only you can do, Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, amen. Amen. Thank you for being here tonight. You may be seated for just a moment. Amen. Brother Dawson. We'll give Brother Dawson a few minutes. We're going to start doing something different. Uh, frequently on Tuesday nights. I'm going to give some young men about seven minutes to preach. We'll call it seven minutes of fire. There ain't no fire. We're gonna choke in the smoke. We just gonna we, we're gonna we're gonna start giving more time to our young men to develop and uh, get some preaching time. Is that all right? I'm not gonna lie. I have been fretting over this all day, <laughs> stressing over it. Um, trying to come up with something to prepare for tonight. And I did come up with something, but I think it's going to wait till next Tuesday night. Mm -hmm. And while I was just standing there, while the Holy Ghost was coming, something else came over my spirit that I wanted to say tonight. Um, before service, I was talking to Brother Stephen out in the parking lot. And it dawned on me just a couple of moments ago, this is what I'm supposed to talk about two weeks ago, um, we had an incredible service, and that's when God really started. We really started getting our, I like to call our mojo back. And we started pushing. We started really, really getting at it, and, and we got our old group back. And that's when we were told that God's about to start doing more miraculous things in this place. And I'm very excited about that. I'm very grateful and excited for what he's already done. But just to tell you something that's already begun. I had a gentleman that came to the store that I work at. He, he comes in every so often. He drives trucks for a big corporation, and so he only comes in about once a month. He and I have never really talked much about church. He knows uh, I go to church here. He knows I'm the student pastor here, uh, but he's not a very religious fellow. He's come, to ch he's come here one time. Hopefully, he'll be back for Easter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he came in last week, and... He said, hey, he made a beeline for me. Normally, he doesn't do that. Normally, he wants to talk to my boss for a couple minutes, then he'll come make a conversation for me. But as soon as he walked in the door, he saw him, and he made a beeline for me. He said, hey, I've got to talk to you. There's something i got to tell you. I said, okay. He said, I had a dream last or a couple of nights ago, and I, I, I don't quite understand it. Can, can you explain it to me a little bit? I said, well, I'll try. I said, I'm not an interpreter, but I'll, uh, I'll do my best, best I can. He said, he said, I was driving my truck for, for my job. He said, and I got in a terrible accident. And he said, and I died. He said, but, you know, most dreams, whenever you die, you wake up immediately. He said, but this time I didn't. He said, this time I found myself standing in a long line. He said, it was like I was up in the clouds or something. He said, I was standing in this long line. It looked like it stretched on for miles. He said, there must have been millions of people. He said, and at the end of that line, there was this great big desk. And at this desk... There sat this great big man, I can only describe him as God, with this big book wide open. And he would say a person's name and tell all the things that they've done in their lifetime. And then they'd have an angel on either side of them. And he'd say something to one angel and after he would finish talking about this person's life. And they would grab him and bring him. And there you would see these fiery pits that they would be cast into. He said, then 
sometimes he would say something else to these other people. He said this other angel on the other side would grab him and, and bring him and walk him in through the gates of heaven. And I said, okay. I said, well, what's your question? He said, well, as I got closer, he said, I thought it was going to take forever. He said, but in the blink of an eye, I was at the foot of this desk. And right before me, he called out a man's name. And he said something along, the, I'm paraphrasing his exact words. He said something along the lines of, uh, uh, well done, good servant, or something like that. I said, okay. He said, but a couple people earlier, I had heard him say something about the park for me. And he, he started getting big tears in his eyes. And he said, then when he called my name, he started reading everything out of my life that I've done. Everything I've ever done was in that book. He said, it, it was crazy. He said stuff that I thought nobody else knew. He said it. Uh -oh. He said, and then at the very end of it, he said, depart from me. Uh -oh. I do not know you. He said, then this big angel came and he grabbed me and he started walking me towards that fire, that pit of fire. He said, the last second, he said, the last thing I remember before waking up was being thrown to that pit. He said, right before the flames hit me, he said, I woke up screaming in bed. He said, my wife, it startled my wife and she grabbed me, shaking me. What, what's wrong? What's wrong? He said, I, I, I don't know. He said, but I'm scared to death. He said, can you, can you, is, does any of that sound biblical whatsoever? <laughs> I just looked at him. I said, I, I said, I said, when, when was the last time you read your Bible? He said, man, it's, it's been a few years. Yeah. I said, have you ever read the book of Revelation? He said, tell you the truth, I didn't even know there was a book called Revelation. <laughs> I said, well, man, you just basically described Judgment Day. Exactly. He, he said, so not everyone's going to make it. Not everyone's going to make it. Some people are going to, even though they've done good in their life, they're, they're, they're going to, well, they're not going to make it. I, I yep. said that. Yeah, that is good. He, he said, yeah. and he started crying. He said, "Explain this to me. How how is this so?" And so I started telling him about repentance. I started telling him about baptism. Yeah. I started telling him about the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And he just was crying right there in the store with me. And he asked me. He said, "When I was there a couple of weeks ago at your church, or a couple of months ago, he, he said I heard these these people saying funny things. He said it was like a foreign language." I said, "That was the well, evidence of speaking in other tongues." He said, "I think I need that." I said, yeah. "I think I need that." Come with me, Easter I said, we can get you what you missed out on this I am excited for what God is doing in this place. It is not just beginning. It has already begun. And it is only going to go further than where we've been before. There is no telling who will come to your job site. Young people, there is no telling who will come up to you at school. And who will just say, I need to know what does this mean? What is happening in our world? Do you have an answer? I have an answer. His name is Jesus. The one true name. sermon tonight. That was the will of God. I need the ushers to come quickly, because now I'm itching to preach. Let's give unto the Lord tonight. Bring your gift while they worship and sing. Lead us in worship again, and uh, be faithful to giving unto the Don't forget. I'll, I'll give announcements after I get to preaching tonight. I'm not going to preach very long tonight. Let's bring our gift unto the Lord.
praise him that has all power. Will all of us need to give him some praise in this place? Tell somebody next to you, God is bigger than everything you're in the middle of. God is bigger than everything. Everything you're in the middle of. Y'all go down worship it. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. If you're a guest tonight, we're honored that you are with us. If you're a guest online, we're very happy that you have joined us tonight. And I encourage you to be inviting people for Sunday. I'm going to the book of Exodus chapter 12. It's good to see Sister Spence's sister with us tonight. She said we're preacher's daughter and I said oh that's the worst troublemaker <laughs> she said not us <laughs> I'm glad that she's here visiting sister Spence book of Exodus chapter 12 the Lord started doing a little study preparing for Sunday and this came across my radar this morning I said whoa hang on right here Verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. Shall be the first month of the year to you. It's a month of Nisan for the Jews. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth month, day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb. According to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house. Take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And ye shall keep it under the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And everybody say in Jesus' name. Jesus. Speak to us, Lord. Jesus. May be seated in the name of the Lord. Book of Genesis chapter 15, the Lord told Abram, of a surety thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and they shall serve them, and they shall afflict them for 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. Afterwards shall they come out with great substance. In our text tonight, the fulfillment of that promise is about to happen. After 400 years of suppression, the Jews were about to be delivered. What they did not understand was all of the powerful implications and prophetic inferences that would be released during God's plan for their deliverance. What God was about to unleash in Egypt and what God was about to unfold in their homes had such long range implications that if God would have told them everything that was going to be given them as types and signs concerning the salvation of men all through time, 
they would not have believed. To fulfill his promise of deliverance, God performed wonders that most of our Christian education children could declare. Wonders in Egypt that were beyond comparison. Water turned to blood. Frogs invaded the land. Lice invaded the land. Flies. The beasts were smitten with murrain. People were smitten with boils. Hail fell. Locusts covered the land. And then a darkness so deep and gross that they could hardly see their hand in front of their face. While the Egyptians were suffering, the Jews were preparing. Because the promise of God is, I am about to get you out of Egypt. The Egyptians were absolutely unaware of the powerful messianic propositions that were being unleashed in their midst. And while Israel was oppressed with slavery, a type of slavery that painted sin's picture of suppression upon the soul of men spiritually, God was preparing a final demonstration with a lamb that would release the Jews. And I still believe that God has prepared a great final demonstration by the lamb that is going to bring about the release of his people. I still believe God's going to do something in the last days that is going to trump everything he has done up until this point. I really still believe that. Would you look at your neighbor and say, I believe that too. God was going to do something with a lamb that he could not do with frogs or water or lice or boils or darkness. God was going to do something with a lamb. It's interesting. I, I, I don't have this in my notes, but in my, my little study I was doing today, it is interesting to note that it does not matter how many lambs were going to be killed on this Passover night. Every time God spoke about it, he said, lamb, singular, because he was preparing them for the lamb that was to come that would take away the sin of the world and he would only be one Lord. It didn't matter that 73,000 sheep would be killed that night. Every time God referenced their exodus, he did so in singular fashion because the Savior that was coming here, O oh Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord, he is one. Oh, somebody say hallelujah. A lamb was going to suffer for every house to be saved from Egypt. For every house, a Passover lamb was going to become the pivotal point for deliverance from slavery. And God in his infinite wisdom, knowing this Passover lamb would be a picture of a Savior to come, did not leave that lamb to just anybody's definition. He said it's got to be a lamb of the first year. And it's got to be a lamb that is without blemish. That means it has to be perfect, complete, innocent, without spot, without sores, without scars, nothing missing. Nothing deformed. God could have said, get me a lamb out of your flock and offer it. But instead, he gave definition. It's got to be of the first year. And it's got to be without blemish. I wish I had time to just, uh, but I don't. This lamb would be part, final part of God's plan of excess. It involved every house carefully choosing an innocent lamb to die for their deliverance. And since it had to be without blemish, can you imagine a father that had a wife and three or four kids at home that has been coming home every day? beaten for years his back is full of scars 
His wife is full of scars. His children have never known the sounds of freedom. I can sure imagine he did not go to the pasture and say, let me just find the one that's close to matching. Let me find the one that may be a little smaller, but he still fits the criteria. No, sir. He knew that his family deliverance depended upon the quality of the lamb. That lamb was the ticket out of Egypt. And he knew if I'm going to have less scars on my back, I need the right lamb. If my wife is going to leave out of Egypt still alive, I need the right lamb. If my kids are not going to be molested and raped and maligned in Egypt, I need the right lamb. And so that dad goes to the pasture and he moves and maneuvers through every lamb that's under a year old. And he checks every year and he looks in the nose. He checks the chin. He feels underneath to make sure there's no ruptures or there's that there's no kind and that there's no scars. He picks up every foot to make sure the feet are not deformed. He looks at the tail. He looks at the back of the legs. He looks under the chest. He feels everywhere. And he says, Boy, that one looking really good. But let me see if I can find one that's even got better confirmation. Let me see if I can find one that'll be even more pleasing. If this is going to be the lamb that gets me out of here. I'm not trying to skip by. I'm not trying to just skip by. I'm not trying to just find the one that might work. I want to make sure it's the best lamb that I have in my pasture. Somebody say hallelujah. Notice the Lord did not give him a size to choose. He just gave him a quality. Because in every pasture with hundreds of sheep, the genes can be just a little different. And so sheep, lambs that are nine months old apiece, you can have 20 that are nine months old apiece, but they're going to look a little different. There's going to be a little difference in size according to the bloodline. So I got to look at in my studies a one-year-old lamb, depending on the particular breed and bloodline and genes of that day, can weigh anywhere between 80 to 110 pounds, and the carcass was 50 percent of the weight. Therefore, it's easily possible that any home that went and picked a lamb when they got it home, that one lamb provided 30 to 40 pounds of meat. So God, knowing that this lamb had prophetic implications, knowing the lamb they were bringing to their house was pointing toward the spotless lamb of God, the jewel of heaven, when he gave Moses the instructions, he said when they bring that lamb of one year that is without spot, if the household is too little for the lamb, then you get your neighbor, and your neighbor and you together are going to partake of the same lamb according to every man's eating. Because that one lamb means too much to waste. That one lamb may has too much meaning for later. Once you choose the lamb, if there's too much for your household, then let the lamb be for your house and your neighbor. Don't waste the lamb. Share the lamb with your neighbor. I come into your consideration in this house tonight that for everybody in this house, you ought to be saying, my house is too little for the lamb. Because this lamb is way too powerful. This way a lamb is way too long, way too, way, way, has way too much authority. This lamb means too much. This lamb can heal every sickness. This lamb can move every sin. This lamb can heal every disease. This lamb can put marriages back together. This lamb can fix minds. This lamb can heal your spirit. This lamb can fix everything that nothing in this world can fix. I'm here to declare to you that the lamb is way too much for just your house. And it's time to quit wasting the lamb. It's time to share the lamb with your neighbor. He 
said, this blood shall be a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over. That word token meant a sign of something better to come. It's a mark of a covenant. It's the evidence of an agreement between two parties. Bear with me just a moment. Genesis 22 and 8. God said to Abraham, Abraham said of God, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. 1 Corinthians 5 and 7. It says that Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. Can I remind you of a little bit of history? God told Moses on the 10th day of the month, Nisan, they choose a lamb. They carry it home and they keep it at home for four days. And at the ninth hour or three o'clock on that fourth day, they kill that lamb. They put the blood on the doorpost and the little. They go in and they roast that lamb. They don't sodden it down with water. They roast that lamb. They eat that lamb with bitter herbs, with the shoes on. Say their bags back. Say we're gonna leave here quickly. That happened in three. They picked, they picked the lamb on the tenth day. On the fourteenth day, the lamb was slain at three o'clock. They had three hours to eat because at six o'clock the fifteenth day started. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. right. You go to your Bible and find it. It was on the tenth day of Nisan that Jesus Christ come riding into Jerusalem on a little donkey and the crowd said Hosanna, Hosanna Hosanna in the highest blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord they were examining the lamb and they were choosing him as the lamb then but four days later on Thursday afternoon on the 14th day of Nisan at exactly the ninth hour you read it in your Bible at 3 o'clock on Thursday evening the scripture says Jesus said why hast thou forsaken me and he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost just as they did in Egypt on that night when the first Passover was instituted Jesus at the same hour at the ninth hour on the 14th day of Nisan gave up the ghost as our Passover lamb that's in your right you get a whole lot of help right now no wonder John looked at Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away. He didn't just say, Take away your sins. He takes away the sin. Somebody help me right now. He takes away the sin of. He takes away the sin of. First Timothy 2 6, Paul said that Jesus gave himself as a ransom for. Oh. Oh. Oh, to be testified in due time. First John 2 and 2. John said he is the propitiation for our sin and not ours only, but for the sin of the whole world. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Amen. Revelation 22 and 17. And the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him that heareth say, come. Let him that is a thirst come. And who? So ever will let him take the water of life freely. It's about the sin of the whole world. It's about whosoever will. It's about a ransom for all. It's about taking away the sin of the whole world. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place and obtained eternal redemption for us. I've come to preach the POC tonight that my house is too little for the lamb. There's enough lamb to go around and it's not time to waste the lamb. Y'all yeah, were clapping a while ago, but you know where I'm going now. You know, quit clapping now. Come on. We want to holler about the Passover lamb, but there was only one reason for the Passover lamb. To get out of destruction. Revelation chapter 7, he said, After this I beheld, lo, a great multitude that no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne 
and before the Lamb. Thank you, Dawson. Clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. He said, I saw a multitude that nobody could number. Every nation, every kindred, every people, every tongue that stood before the throne. Y'all are missing what I'm saying right now. A great multitude that no man could number. Every nation, every kindred, every people, every tongue. A great multitude that no man could number. Of every nation, every kindred, every people, and every tongue. Because there's too much land for your little house. I don't care how many times you've been healed. There's still enough land to pass around. Our world is desperate. Our world is hungry. Our world is broken. Our world is in need. And the only answer is the land. If you should ever say we got the answer. cried with a loud voice saying salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne under the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne about the elders and the four beasts that fell before the throne and on their faces and they worshiped saying amen and blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor. Power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. Mark chapter 2. Jesus was in a house in Capernaum. And the scripture says it was noised abroad he was in the house and there were so many people that squeezed in that house that your Bible says there was not even room for people to on the outside of the door to even see in because that house was too little for the lamb there were more people needing access to him than what that house could hold How bold, arrogant, and proud do we have to be to say, I don't need to share the lamb. He's in my house. And he's doing something in my house. It doesn't matter that there's people that need in. Man's work. Come on. Come on. The house was full, but people and needs just kept coming. The ones that knew he was their only hope kept coming. And the only recorded miracle. For that day was for four men that was carrying a lame man that was willing to make room where there was no room. For the others that were just enjoying being in the house with the lamb, there's not one recorded miracle. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying right now? The only miracle was for the ones that said, I know that house is little, but I got to get to the land. I want to say it like I need to say it. I don't want to miss out on the miraculous. I've had the Holy Ghost since 1978. I don't want to miss out on the miraculous just because I'm in the house with the Lamb. I want to still be one that's saying, bring another one in. Let me tear a roof off them. I've got to tear a roof off them. i got to do whatever I've got to do to get somebody to Jesus because the Lamb cannot be wasted. Did your neighbor say the Lamb cannot be wasted? Certain Greeks came to Philip and said, Sir, we would see Jesus. The lamb is too big for your house. Your house, for those that are wondering, I've really got my landing gear down. Your house is way too small for the lamb. Jesus. 
Luke chapter 4, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To preach deliverance to the captives. Recovering of sight to the blind. And set at liberty them that are bruised. The Lamb, Jesus Christ, our Passover, is powerful. He's already defeated death. He cured a man that was sick for 38 years. He had, he, he's tamed the nature, rebuking wind and waves and walking on water. He washed the sins of the believers away. He cast out a legion of demons by simply saying, come out. Our Passover lamb is powerful. That same Passover lamb is going to give a shout and there's going to be a trump of God's sound. And every saint dad is suddenly going to burst out of its grave. Uh, every saint that remains is suddenly going to be changed into a body like unto his glorious body because the Lamb is powerful. Everybody's looking for hope, but hope can only be found in the Lamb. It's not time to waste the Lamb. Your house is too little for the Lamb. There's more value there. There's more glory there. There's more anointing there. He said, when you get your lamb, if it's too big for your family, share it with your neighbor. Well, I've got news for everybody in this house. The lamb is way too big for your house. What would God do through us if we'd be willing to start sharing the lamb? And not waste the lamb. The spotless lamb came. He reached for the Samaritan, the half-breeds. He reached for the Italian named Cornelius. He reached for the Roman governor named Felix. He reached for the barbarian on the island of Miletus. He reached for the Ethiopian eunuch. He preached to the Greeks at Mars Hill because the lamb is way too powerful and way too big for this house. We've got to get out of these walls. You've got to get out of your walls. You've got to reach for somebody. you got to share the lamb. Your house is too little for the lamb. Your hope. I'm preaching to people that are holding the lamb captive behind walls of tradition when our world is starving for the lamb. It's time to share the lamb and quit wasting the lamb. The lamb said to you to take him and to share him with the neighbor. Acts 26 says this wasn't done in the corner. It did not stay. What happened in Acts chapter 2. Are y'all still with me? Amen. Did not stay in the upper room. Though he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. He was never meant to be corralled. By religious folk that are happy with a holy museum. Acts chapter 2. They were told do not depart from the room until after you receive the promise. He never meant for them to get so happy with the promise that they dance in place. They were told the reason for the promise is to give you power to go into the city and into Judea the regionally and Samaria abroad and to the uttermost parts of the earth to be a witness. They were only to stay in the upper room until they got holy power from on high. And then they were to go house to house, city to city, region to region because our house is too little for the Lamb. That upper room held 120, but it was way too small for the Lamb. I know nobody here knows this, but I can't be very sarcastic. And I had a sarcastic streak sneak in on my anointing today. I looked it up just to make sure. But the word curator is not found anywhere in the Bible. 
For those that are looking funny, that's just somebody that sits and watches the museum. And just keeps the museum. To make sure nothing is stolen out of the museum. The word curator is not in your Bible. There's a reason for that. He didn't call you to a museum. He didn't call you to sit sour and soak and enjoy a museum. There is a synonym for curator that's in the Bible. It's the word keeper. And it is most often used when speaking of a prison. So the house that was meant to be a launch pad for harvest and revival becomes prisons when saints become curators instead of disciples. When our testimony is more about what we used to see than what we do say, we become curators. Well, glory, hallelujah. I'm feeling it all over me. Some of y'all done lost me right now. Y'all was shouting a while ago and had about 25 standing, clapping, saying amen. You lost your amen. But God didn't call you to be a curator. He called you to be a disciple. And the word disciple means a learner and a pupil. Jesus never rejoiced just over yesterday. He was always going to reach for somebody else. Go to another. Look at your neighbor and nudge your neighbor and say, boy, he's walking right down our aisle right now. Hallelujah. Huh? Right now, that's correct, right now. It means pupil. It means learner. Follower. You cannot say if you're, you're a disciple if you are just enjoying the museum. He went to the house of Mary and Martha. He went to the house of Jairus. He went to the house of Zacchaeus. He went to the house of Peter. And he was so kind, he healed his mother-in-law. He went to the house of Matthew. He went to the house of the Pharisees in Luke chapter 7. He went to the house in Tyre in Mark chapter 7. He, went, he wasn't in homes. When he wasn't in homes, he was surrounded by a crowd on the seashore, on the mountainside, or in the temple. He allowed Paul to be put in a prison because there was a guard that was ready to believe. He put Paul in a ship that was going to sink because there was a barbarian that needed healing on an island. Because your house is too much for the lamb Or too little for the lamb Your house is too little for the lamb Quit fussing and cussing over where God brings you in life And start looking for who you're supposed to present the lamb to about to hit the runway. <laughs> so there was a Cornelius in a house in Caesarea whose family needed salvation. The problem was the answer was in Joppa. In a house. And so the Lord had to speak to a dude at the house of Simon the Tanner in Joppa and say I have somebody else in a house right down the road that needs what you've already got leave this house and go to the house of Cornelius when they come calling for you and the Lord is hardly through speaking when I knock on the door and somebody there was saying we got a house full of people that's wanting to know if you'll share your lamb with us And the church for the Gentiles in Caesarea was open because Peter, after he got the Holy Ghost, understood the upper room is not is, is still too small for the Lamb. And Simon the Tanner's house is too small for the Lamb. What God is wanting to do is way bigger than I can comprehend. And so I'm going to get off of this roof. I'm going to follow these Italian people to this devout man in Caesarea. And I'm going to preach the Lamb. And when he got there, the Holy Ghost fell. And filled every one of them and they were all baptized 
because somebody recognized that his house was too little for the land. Acts 16, Paul and Silas, you can stand, were, I ain't never preached this short. God, dear Lord, forgive me. In Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas went to the house of Lydia after she was baptized. And her and the other ladies fed them, ministered to their needs. She got baptized, got the Holy Ghost, and Paul and Silas went to her house. Then they said, we, we must needs go. And they went to prison and had a praise service in prison. And God shook the prison. And after they got out, they didn't say, thank you, Jesus, for delivering me. Nice to see everybody here. God bless you. I hope you find a way to heaven. They found the man that was the most fearful, the jailer, who was scared to death. He's fixing to lose his life over a jailbreak that he had no control over. And he said, what am I supposed to do? And he said, we can come to your house today, baptize you today. They went from the house of Lydia to jail, to the house of of a jailer. Amen. When they could have been satisfied to beat their chest and say, well, we baptized two or three over here with Sister Lydia. We baptized two or three. We had a good meal. It's just time to go on home and retire. But instead, they let a jail experience lead them to another house experience because they felt the burden of the Lamb. Recognize there was still more of the lamb to digest than it had already been partaken of. House to house. Your house is too little for the lamb. Let me help us all out tonight. If you try to confine the lamb to your four walls, you can only do so in your mind and in your perspective because the lamb is far greater than all of our little houses combined. And the lamb is trying to get out. How foolish would we be how foolish would that dad have been? Hey, their sheep were their livelihood. Brother Randall, their, their sheep wasn't just what they fed in the pasture. They made sure they had good water and took care of it. That represented their tomorrows. If I lose all my sheep, I have no vocation. I have no income. But I've got to get my family out of Egypt. Amen. And for them to go to all the trouble uh, to pick the perfect lamb and bring it home. And then to get the idea. You know what? It's getting me out. It really don't matter what happens to the rest of it. And take the other 10 or 15 pounds of meat that they couldn't eat that evening and say, hey, this was the best lamb I ever had, but I'll just throw the rest in the basket. I'm getting out of here, so it really doesn't matter what happens to the lamb. Oh, gosh. I'd like to scream at the Jewish men of those days if I could. Sir, let me help you. If you could see the big picture, it's really not about you at all. It's really all about the Lamb. From Genesis to Revelation, they're not going to look at the saints that are coming back and said, blessed are they that come in the name of the Lord. 
They're not going to see the saints with a vesture dipped in blood and a name written on their thigh. The world's not going to be fearful when they look up and see saints coming in clouds on white stallions. When they look up and see him whom they have pierced. When they look up and see him with a vesture that's dipped in blood. And the name written on his thigh. King of kings and Lord of lords. They're going to say blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. Let me help you out saying the only reason you're here is because the lamb was perfect. And the lamb was spotless. And the lamb was holy. And the lamb was pure. And the lamb's blood was precious. And the purpose of the lamb is to get us out of here. But it's really not about us. The only reason for the bride is because there's a bridegroom. It's really about the lamb. And we can't hold what's left of the lamb. And say, I'll just, well, my family's in the church. I'll just discord the rest of them. I'm delivered. So it really don't matter what happens to the rest of the lamb. Your house is too little. I don't care how long you've been in Pentecost. I don't care how long you've claimed the Holy Ghost. I don't care how many times he's healed your body and washed your sin away. Your house is still too little for the lamb. The lamb's coming back. And the lamb's going to catch away on people that have prepared themselves. I say it's time to share the lamb with our neighbors and not waste the lamb. Does anybody feel called to the altar tonight like I do? Our house is too little for the lamb. We get a chance to share the lamb with our neighbors. Our house is too little for the lamb. Would you come and make some commitments to God about what you're going to do with the lamb? Would you, would you come and lift your hands and reach up to heaven right now and let Jesus talk to you? Come on, let Jesus talk to you about sharing the Lamb. Let Jesus talk to you about sharing.